Good evening, and thank you for watching this edition of In Focus on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. I'm Eric Marsh, Executive Director of Whitewater Community Television. Glad you're able to join us for what is going to be a special 90-minute edition of the In Focus program. We do that when Mayor Snow is nice enough to stop by. Um, want to get as many questions in as possible and also give him as much time to answer those questions as possible. So we'll turn to him in just a moment. Last week's program, if you watched, was shortened. We ended up um, just having a miscommunication with our guests. We've been doing this show for almost four years and you know it's going to happen at some point, but it has been rescheduled. Our guest last week was supposed to be Elijah Welsh from Richmond Sanitary District, or so we thought. He had a different date on his calendar. We have worked out a date, so next week here we will have Elijah. The show, though, will not be live. We are going to tape that program the day before. So. If you have a question that you would like me to ask Elijah, feel free to send that question to us, WCTV at IUE.edu. Get it to us by um, Wednesday at noon, next Wednesday at noon, and we'll be sure to ask that question on the air so Elijah can answer it. The show will air in its normal time, 6 o'clock here on Thursday night, 10.30 Thursday again on Friday night, twice on Saturday, twice on Sunday, but Thursday night, 6 p.m. airing won't be live. So send us your questions for Elijah Welsh about the Richmond Sanitary District, their sewer rates, and what it is that they're planning on doing, and he'll be explaining all of that. But if you have a question from what you've heard through council meetings or later on after this show, the Committee of the Whole meeting from last night, be sure to send us those questions. Um, the week after that, we'll be running a uh, replay of a program, and then on the 26th of October, we have another special 90-minute program, this one discussing the opioid problem in the community, but not really just the problem. It's about trying to help you get some, some answers to some questions that you might have. We'll have a panel of folks here from Reed Health, Centerstone, and Meridian Health Services. You can send your questions again ahead of time. We want to make sure that the questions are appropriate to ask. What we're trying not to do is make sure that somebody's name doesn't slip out or something along those lines. So we want to be able to answer your questions about yourself, family members, how to get help, where to get help, other issues surrounding that. And uh, then we'll have a 90-minute program on that coming up on the 26th of October. So if you have questions regarding that, you can send questions again to WCTV at IUE.edu. And I'll remind you of those shows again near the end. And that's probably, those two topics are probably a great place to bring in our guest, Mayor Dave Snow. Nice enough to be back with us again. Appreciate you coming in. Oh, thanks for the invitation, Eric. I, I love being here and I appreciate the opportunity. Not a problem. Hate the fact that you're having to miss uh, Taste of Wayne County and the Business uh, Expo. Yeah, I'm missing out on a lot of good food and networking opportunities, but yes. that's okay. I, I really appreciate this this time, and uh, we always have great conversations. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, and again, I... I really don't write down a lot of questions. We just kind of go with it. Yeah. Obviously, we've got two shows coming up mm -hmm. that are hot and button issues and have been for a while. Let's start with the first one. Next week, we'll talk to Elijah Welsh. Last night, there was a committee of the whole meeting Correct. as the Richmond Common Council again tried to get some of their questions answered about the, I believe it's 35 percent mm -hmm. um, rate increase that they are suggesting over a three-year period. This is a department, obviously, that is part of the city, so you have right. just named a new person to run mm -hmm. that and we'll get to that but let's start with what you know about the rates why they're doing it whether the three-tier system is needed and things of that nature. Sure. Well, what you're seeing is the result it's, it's a mandate uh, it's combined sewer overflow long-term control plan if you remember uh, growing up here in Richmond years ago every time we'd get in the lightest rain you'd always hear the combined sewer overflow alerts Right. And you've probably noticed that you don't hear those as much anymore because our sanitation engineering department has been working and working to separate those combined sewer overflows. And what that really means, it's a, it's a fancy sanitation engineering term that means when rainwater surges uh, the sewer system, it can cause overflows and it makes the rainwater combine with the sewage water and then overflow into the river. And that's what those combined sewer overflow, so overflow alerts always were. It would say, stay out of the river downstream of the CSO, or right. the combined sewer overflow. So we've been working to get those separated. We have more mandates that, you know, as there's a lot more environmental mandates uh, in today's world than there were 20 and 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. and, and we want to preempt a lot of those as well. We don't sit and wait to be mandated to make moves. We want to preempt these as much as we can because that's important to us. 
Um, and so what you're seeing is a lot of work in our long-term control plan of getting those CSOs separated. Uh, and that does, it, it comes at a high price tag, but it's very important we're making that investment in our infrastructure and our environment to get this done. Um, our financial forecasting shows that it would actually be too expensive to do every single one of them, but this plan will take us to such a minimal number of CSOs that we should see close to no more combined sewer overflow alerts, which is where we want to, where we want to end up. So uh, it's, it's a good place to be, although we take rate increases very seriously. Sure. I mean, this affects everyone in our, in our city, in our sanitation district. And so you saw a very thorough conversation last night between Common Council and the Sanitation Board. I was there, our city controller was there, Elijah Welch was there. Uh, and I appreciate that conversation because we need to take this very seriously. And I know that everybody on the Sanitation Board and everyone on our Common Council takes their financial responsibility to our taxpayers very seriously. Mm -hmm. And so we want to make sure that this is the right way to go, that we're walking the right path, and that the increases that we uh, implement are having the most impact. And so it's, it's, it's a long process, and we need to have a lot of conversation about it to make sure that we're doing this in the right way. And it has been a long process because there were rate increases over the last three or four years right. th that were for bonds that were for some of the first projects exactly. of this that came This was about. a big problem here. We have a very old sewer system in a lot of places. I mean, in some parts of the city, it's over 100 years old. And things were very different over 100 years ago. Right. Uh, one of the big complications in this process is, uh, you know, when you have more parking lots, the rain surges into the system quicker. It's not moving through the ground uh, and through the water table. It's just hitting a parking lot, surging right into the drain and right into the system. And so we have to work harder and harder to keep those overflows from happening because we really want to keep that bacteria out of our river water. And so that's, it's all part of this long-term process. Some of this has also stopped some flooding in some areas Absolutely, of yeah. the city that, mm -hmm. that used to flood on a regular basis, yes. even with rain as light as we've had today, and we maybe have had a half inch, but mm -hmm. even that used to cause some people some, some Absolutely. issues. Absolutely, and when you look at the uh, long-term control plan booklet that Elijah Welch has handed out, and I'm sure he'll have some slides he'll bring with him for your program, Yes, uh, this will even curb more of that flooding. So he'll show you pictures of some areas that flood easily even still, and how we can uh, mitigate that quite a bit through through this process. So. It, it's necessary work. It just, it's expensive work. It's a lot of work. It takes many years. And so, again, we, were, we continue to refer to what's called a long-term control plan because this is a years-long process, uh, and it's going to take a while to get there. And when you say it's mandated, it's, ma it's a court agreement that all of this has to be done. Absolutely. And there is actually an end deadline when all of this is supposed to be Absolutely. finished. Absolutely, yes. And, 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 then, and we could say we choose not to do it, but it would be imposed on us either way and be much more expensive at that point. And we have been able to uh, survey the landscape and see that there are other cities that have gone that route and it has not worked out very well for them. So we want to be ahead of the curve and, and be proactive as much as we can. One of the last questions that came out last night Councilman Jamie Lopeman asked, and he mm -hmm. said the one question that he's gotten most from his constituents is, when will our sewer rates go back down? Mm -hmm. There was an article in the paper where the sanitary district representatives basically said, well, it's probably not going to happen. Right, right. How do you explain that to people? Because it sounds sure. like the rates are going into place to pay for the bonds mm -hmm. to do the work. Mm -hmm. So once the bonds are paid off, mm -hmm. Why don't we get the rates back? Yeah, and, and you really shouldn't, that's sort of an incorrect way to tie it all together. You have to look at it as rate increase for investment in our infrastructure as a city because we have to invest in that. We have to have a strong infrastructure that is not only environmentally sound but uh, is prepared for the years to come because we're, we're preparing for the, for the future. Uh, we're not just band-aiding a problem that we're having right now. We're preparing for the long road ahead uh, and investing in our infrastructure. And so. When you look at that, and why wouldn't the rates come back down? Be mm -hmm. uh, Buzz Crone, uh, who is our financial advisor for our sanitation department, was quick to say, look, uh, saying the rates would go back down would be under an assumption that there will be no problems in the future with the infrastructure of your sanitation department, your wastewater treatment facility. It's not going to be the case. There's always going to be problems, and everything's more expensive tomorrow than it is today. And so uh, we, we have to maintain that investment so that we have the funds necessary to continue to make that investment in our infrastructure structure. But even after, uh, you may have seen the chart last night, and again, I'm sure Elijah will bring this. I don't want to preempt too much of, of, sure. of, of his presentation, but 
uh, even after the final phase, because uh, this is a multi-phase project, mm -hmm. and right now we're really just kind of mostly discussing phase one, because uh, it's what's in front of us right now, but this moves out to three phases. Even after the third phase and the third increase in the rates, mm -hmm. uh, we're still middle ground compared to where other cities' rates are right now before they go through their updates and their infrastructure investments over the next five, 10, and 15 years. And this should put us in a stabilizing pattern for quite a long time. So uh, yes, the rates are gonna go up, but Richmond will still enjoy very, very competitive sanitation rates compared to other cities for the infrastructure that we'll have in place. So that's, that's important to keep in mind. Okay, as we stay on the sanitary district, you've recently named a new director for that. William mm -hmm. Harris announced his retirement yes. a while ago. He stayed. He did stay. <laughs> I, I just can't thank William Harris enough. You know, he was a great guy to work with, and uh, he and I had really developed a, a really strong rapport with one another, and he was a tremendous asset to the city. Uh, but he did finally get to uh, begin his much-deserved retirement. The pictures were great. He had a smile on his face. He did have a smile, didn't he? Uh, so I have appointed uh, a captain from our police department, uh, Captain Brian Irvin is our sanitation director and he has hit the ground running he's doing a great job uh, he has been with our he was originally with our fire department for i think a little over two years and then served uh, 17 and some years with our police department earned the rank of captain mm -hmm. he's a graduate of the fbi academy and uh, earned a master's degree while in the police department and was really seeking uh, a higher level management position and this was a perfect opportunity for him. He has the leadership skills, he has the people skills, and he has the ability to learn and put the knowledge base under him. Uh, several people have, just to, just to be blunt, several people mm -hmm. come to me and say, uh, this guy's background is in, is in policing. Where's his background in sanitation? Well, and the, and the very blunt answer yeah, to that is... answer this. <laughs> <laughs> the, the very blunt answer to that is, uh, we have superstars in sanitation already. I mean, you're bringing Elijah Welch on uh, you know, in the, right. on your next program. Elijah is fantastic and a, and a real superstar of the city with what he does in our engineering department. I don't need another superstar quarterback or another superstar running back on the team. I need a good coach that knows where to put those stars and how to keep them moving forward. And that's what Brian's going to excel at. That's where his strong suit is. Okay. Yeah. We'll come back to your staff in a little bit because you've, you've made, since you've been mayor, a, a number of different appointments, a number yeah. of different changes. So I, I want to catch up and talk about um, some of the people that you've hired, the work that they've done, um, and how this time has gone on. But I want to move on to um, the, the next show that I talked about that we're going to have talking about the opioid problem. This mm -hmm. is something that you talked about even while you were running for the office. Yes. You sat in and I assume continue to sit in on the heroin is here and other um, groups that are meeting. That is a problem that isn't going away. Mm -hmm. You, during your state of the city, talked about from a city standpoint not being able to help on one side, but really dealing with it on a policing side, mm -hmm. telling the drug dealers it's time mm -hmm. to get out. Absolutely. How is that effort going with the police department, mm -hmm. considering their manpower issues? And, and again, people who, who watch the Committee of the Whole meeting following this show mm -hmm. will hear the chief say, we're down to about 66 officers, mm -hmm. which is 11 or so below where you right. want to be. How is that effort going? And what changes have you seen? I think it's going well, and we set out in this budget process to add two new officers to the department to even help with that more. I've had a lot of conversations with Chief Branham, who had experience uh, for years with managing our drug task force, which was one of the uh, main factors in him being selected as chief. He, he knows the ins and outs of this, and he knows how to attack this from a law enforcement side. So we have uh, set out on a course to add two police officers to the department in 2018. That was one of the points of conversation we had last night was uh, we were going to allow the permission to spend, if you will, through the budget to add those two officers and realized that through retirement and through other factors, we're down so many officers, we can take that permission out of the budget and then add it back once we get to that point next year because we have a lot of hiring up to do. Right. Uh, so he is in a, in a hiring phase right now. And, and that brings us just to another good point. You know, when I go around and talk to the community, people will say, what can I do? What can I do? To, I, I, I want to play a more active role in the community. I want to help. And always keep in mind that our police department is there to protect and serve. That's a real calling. And so I really encourage uh, people to want to step up and be a police officer. Uh, we really need good, qualified people that will step up and want to be a part of this wonderful department because 
you're serving your city, but you're serving your neighborhood and your community. And it means a lot as an officer when you return back to that neighborhood because you know, you know those people, you know your neighbors, you know how to talk to the people in your neighborhood. And so we just need more people to want to step up and be an officer. It, it's such an important role to our community for people who have grown up here to want to protect and serve their hometown. And so I just want to throw that out there, that, that, uh, that, that mm -hmm. call to action, you know, want to be a police officer. Uh, so coming back to the question, um, so we continue to work on that. And I knew that there were two ways that I could attack this from the law enforcement side. So I had a lot of conversations with Chief Branham about what is the optimum number of officers that we could work to add in the budget process that would help us achieve more goals in working on the supply side of the drug problem. If you break it down to its two most basic components, you got a supply side and a demand side. Mm -hmm. How can we affect the supply side through law enforcement and be impactful? I don't want to hire, say, five officers and three are busy and two are not. Where's that spot where we don't see diminishing returns on our investment? And he felt very strongly that let's start with two officers. So that's where we pinpointed. So that's what we're doing in that area. Now in the in the demand side that turns to a community issue. We have people that bring drugs into our community to sell drugs, but they, they have to have people that want drugs. Why are our community members turning to drugs? What is bringing about the, the, the addiction rates that we're seeing? Uh, I spend a lot of time talking to drug counselors, and a lot of it, I'll be honest, is to get my own education. I, I'm very transparent. I didn't grow up in a household where there was a drug issue, so I don't have a, a deep understanding of it. Um, so they, they teach me a lot about how these things begin, some of the factors that lead down that road. Mm -hmm. And in talking to them, not, not the main factor, there's a lot of factors, there's a lot that goes into this, but one of the mm -hmm. factors that seems to overlap, if you were to make a, a Venn diagram of this, isolation is a big factor that leads to drug use. Again, it's not the factor, I don't wanna you know, sure. misquote that. Uh, if isolation is one of those key factors and a feeling of um, not being connected, being disengaged, we can impact that through bringing our neighborhoods back together. It's so one of the ways I struggled very much with how I could play a positive role in that arena. Uh, people come to me and they tell me the stories of what this has done to their families and it's, it's devastating. And I sit at my desk and think, you know, I grew up in this, in this city. I love that this is my hometown. I consider Richmond my home. Uh, when I call it my hometown, I, it's like my home. When something bad happens in Richmond, I, I take it very personal. How can I have an impact on these people that are feeling disconnected and disengaged and feeling isolated, turning to drugs, and it's just tearing families apart? And in talking with these counselors and finding this piece of isolation, that's what made me come to the realization we need to bring our neighborhoods back together. And so I made many grants available out of my office where if you are willing to uh, establish your neighborhood through our neighborhood services office, mm -hmm. uh, assign a block captain, put together a neighborhood meeting, and bring this group together. You can apply for a mini grant of up to $500 out of, uh, they're coming out of my office, but I'm channeling it through our neighborhood services director, uh, Diane Whitehead. Okay. And it's whatever that gathering looks like. It could, be a, it could be a cookout if that's what your neighborhood would respond to. Right. It can just be a meeting at the local church and just have a formal meeting. It, it's, it's whatever's right in your neighborhood and we'll facilitate that and help you with that. And I've encouraged our police officers to uh, attend those, and I'm trying to attend all of them, uh, but we still have a lot more that we could take in. So I, I really wanna step out there and begin to take Richmond back one neighborhood at a time. Because we're all guilty of it. You pull in the garage, you close the garage door, you go in through the kitchen, mm -hmm. you don't say, hi neighbor, how is your day? How you doing? Uh, you need some help mowing your lawn? How are you feeling? We, why have we gotten away from that? Uh, and, and let's get to the really cliche one. At least my generation grew up looking at the very old photos or videos of the old welcome wagon, <laughs> where the neighborhood association had the group that would put together the basket sure. with like some barbecue sauce in it and a button and a sticker. And they'd show up at the, at the new homeowner door and say, we're the welcome wagon, welcome to the neighborhood. This is when the neighborhood meetings are and here's the phone tree, you know. And we think, oh, that's so cliche. We don't do that kind of corny stuff in my neighborhood. Turns out, that's, we need to bring that back. Uh, so when the police go to... So our parents and grandparents didn't have it all wrong. That's huh? right. They were very right. <laughs> Amazing. When our police officers go to these gatherings, they're giving talks on crime watch and crime spotting and crime reporting. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going and talking about the importance of being together and talking to one another. 
uh, and staying in communication. What you're doing when you put that little welcome wagon group together, right? Because a lot of people say, uh, I don't want this stuff to, to come into my neighborhood. Um, okay, so if you put that welcome wagon together and someone new moves in your neighborhood and you go knock on the door and say, hi, we're the welcome wagon. We have a crime watch group that meets on the second Wednesday of the month. We have a, all this. Here's the phone tree. Those people go, man, this is a neighborhood that pays attention. And that sets a whole different tone for the neighborhood at that point. And people know they can talk to one another. So, and I've, and I've stepped up and done it myself. We've established my neighborhood. My neighborhood is now called Westside Commons. It didn't have a name before. Okay. And we have a block captain. We've already had a, a neighborhood gathering, and it's, it's just been really great. So I, I encourage more neighborhoods to do that. So if, if you're watching and you want to do this, uh, call our neighborhood services director, Diane Whitehead, at our non-emergency police line, 983-7247. Okay. Go. There you go. You rolled this out in your state of the city almost a year ago. Yeah. Did you have, uh, have you had three, four, five? I know I you did it in your neighborhood. I think we're working close upwards of 10 now. Really? It's been really great, but we've got room for a lot more, so we need to see more. Okay. And uh, I'm excited for you to have that program with Reed and Meridian. Uh, Meridian is really on the cutting edge of uh, the addiction problem with their new treatment facility. Uh, their 30 bed outpatient treatment facility is a tremendous asset to this city. So I'm excited for your viewers to get to know that a little bit better. Uh, it's, it's really, uh, I, I say cutting edge because it's something we have not had in this fight against the addiction problem we're facing. So we're very fortunate to have that. And they're, they're great community partners and I, I appreciate what they're doing. Talked about policing. Talk about a little bit about the, the, the budget issue um, and, and police trying to add a couple of officers. Um, I know one of the things as you reach out to people and one of the things you talked about, again, even as far back as when you were campaigning and we had you in here before, is, is the makeup of the police department. Mm -hmm. Does the police department reflect what the community is? Mm -hmm. And I know um, one of the things you talked about, one of the things Chief has talked about is trying to get more minority hiring yes. um, on the police department. You've, you've got almost a couple of years under your belt, whether mm -hmm. you believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Probably sleepless nights let you know that, <laughs> that that's true. Yeah. How has that needle begun to move in the city? I know that, that the city of Richmond probably has not hired an African-American police officer in a quarter century. Yeah. And I'm yeah. not, I don't believe exaggerating that number. Right. How do we change that? Yeah, and, and I don't want anyone to think that that conversation has fallen off uh, since campaign mode. Uh, that is a conversation that I have with the chief regularly. As a matter of fact, as we were going through this budget process and we were talking about the current number of officers and the room we have to grow in 18, that was one of the questions you brought up again. How do we continue to make certain that our department is reflective of our community? Mm -hmm. And I know that that's on the chief's mind and he continues to work at it. Uh, it's, it's difficult. I mean... Um, what, what is the answer to that? I think that's more of a discussion than it is a, we, how do you feel about that? Uh, well, I, I, in some ways I think it's sad, in some ways I think it might be a reflection of the community that, mm -hmm. that young people of color don't feel um, engaged mm -hmm. enough in this mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. to to want to hold that position and how has that happened over the years because it hasn't always been the case mm -hmm. there used to be a number of african-american firemen mm -hmm. as well as policemen that i heard about before i ever got here but the numbers as they retired right. were not yes, replaced have. so what happened in this community that that situation turned like mm -hmm. it did i think that may be a conversation that needs to be held and how do we repair that then if that's so far back how do we repair it? What do we do today to repair that? I, I was giving a, a talk at a local church and a gentleman uh, stepped up and he said, uh, I don't believe your officers know how to uh, correctly speak the culture of African-American neighborhoods. They just don't. And I said, but doesn't that tell you that we need people from those neighborhoods to join us to protect and serve their neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, where's the balancing act between absolutely having diversity training on the force, but also uh, having representation of the neighborhoods uh, um, among our ranks because that teaches everyone more diversity and it brings a broader perspective of culture to the department so that we're better serving the community. But so, you're also trying to bring in 
people in the community. And, and, and I, I think, and I don't know the numbers for sure, but I think we may have more officers on the police department that didn't grow up here mm -hmm. than we had for a long time. So, mm -hmm. how, so it's not just a black and white issue. Right, you're right. But it's an issue of mm -hmm. the community. So yeah. I, I think it becomes yeah. still a larger community sure. issue as to why our young people aren't feeling engaged. That's exactly black right. Black and white. And, and we don't even, it's not even a Caucasian African American issue. We've, we've got, we have, we have Latino. Correct. We're our Asian officers. We, I mean, we have, uh, fortunately, I think we have fairly decent gender diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, we have tremendous men and women of our department, uh, but we're not seeing the ethnic diversity that we should see. Right. No, I'm very open about that. And we have to continue to work at that and work harder at it. And if there's a disconnect there, we got to build that bridge somehow. I don't. I don't know. I've gone out and spoken about it many times, mm -hmm. um, but I'm not sure that it's. I'm not sure that the connection is falling into place yet. Uh, the things that we see uh, that are sometimes exaggerated online and things like that aren't helping the dialogue at all. Um, so it it's difficult. Um, so we have to just continue to try to build those bridges. And I would very much like to see uh, that diversified police force that is much more representative of our community, because that's important. Mm -hmm. Budget process went smoothly for you, for the most part, last year. Mm -hmm. First time out, a lot of kudos from, from the council as mm -hmm. to how the process went. Mm -hmm. I think for the most part, the, the conversations with the department heads that first couple of nights went mm -hmm. very quickly, faster yeah. than I've it went seen very it go. Fast, yes. It went very quickly, but you're coming down to the end of this still in somewhat that same quandary that causes some of the council um, to question the end mm -hmm. and the budget at the end. You're still trying to, to close a couple of the union agreements mm -hmm. um, and the money still doesn't seem to be quite balanced. How do mm -hmm. you see this budget cycle compared to the last one? And how do you make it better going forward, particularly when it comes to getting to this time of year mm -hmm. and not having those union contracts done, sure. which based on a conversation that I had with, with city council members here earlier this year, mm -hmm. there's actually an ordinance on the books that says it's supposed to be done mm -hmm. by a certain period of time, April, May, somewhere in that general area. Mm -hmm. How do you get closer to that so that this part of yeah. the, the budget doesn't almost come to a grinding halt. Mm -hmm. And we had that conversation last year as well going into this and you know It's a conversation that's happened for a number just of years keeps too. going. And yes. with the union negotiations, you know, it's it's its own process. We have to negotiate in good faith. Uh, we can't step up to the negotiation table and say here's an offer you have 2 hours to respond. I mean, we just, we, we we cannot in good faith negotiate that way in the union table and so mm -hmm. uh, they they take as long as they take. And so the goal is going to be to keep backing up when we start this in the hopes that we can get this done earlier. Uh, but I think that there's always a sense in the negotiations that maybe we should see where a council's landing from the union side. We should see where council's coming from. They, they're the financial directors. Where are they sitting with this? Are they? And, and it just it can slow the process. But we have to negotiate in good faith. We have to be at that table uh, letting the union representation know that we're negotiating on their best behalf being transparent, being upfront, uh, and so it's, it's, a, it's a long process. Uh, as far as the budget process itself, mm -hmm. I, I feel like it's going very well. Uh, you know, last year it went very smooth. Uh, several council members voiced their uh, questions and comments and said, we'd like to be even more involved. And so this year, I think what you're seeing that's different, whereas it, it may look a little more cumbersome from the outside looking in, we've presented them with a much more organic budget earlier in the process okay. and just said, here it is in a working phase. If you want to be more involved, what are your questions and comments and concerns and where are you looking at it like this? Uh, and you know, so as we've worked through this, I, I think it's been going very, very well. It's been very positive. Uh, we've seen a lot of positive comments and a lot of positive questions, and I think there's always progress and compromise. Mm -hmm. So as we, you, you heard President Hollis say, well, you know, you've made a lot of the changes that we've already asked for, and so they kind of went through it quickly again last night. So we'll continue to take council's comments and questions and concerns and uh, continue to work towards delivering a, a funded budget that we, can, that we can work through. Where's the city financially? We hear from the county. We do a number of county meetings. Mm -hmm. They seem to have money in the bank. Mm -hmm. um, and money to be able to do things. The mm -hmm. city, 
things are a little bit tighter. Where are we standing on things always, a, uh, financially as a city? Yeah, things always stay tight, but we have a we have a reserve. We have a healthy reserve. We're always pushing to increase that reserve. Uh, I think our our magic number that we're always trying to hit is about fifteen percent in our cash reserves. Okay. Uh, so are we there? No, but we do have a healthy reserve, and and we'll keep striving to uh, work with the monies we get as limited as they may be, to provide the services that we need to provide to, to keep our city running. So uh, it's important that you know our parks remain beautiful, our, our potholes get patched up, our streets get paved, our sidewalks get fixed, our curbs get fixed. It's a lot. It's a lot to cover. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when you're working on limited resources, you have to be very careful about where that money goes. And that's where this deep conversation between the administration and council comes from through this budget process. How do we make the most impact with limited resources? And, and I think we do a pretty good job of that. What are the changes that people should look for coming out of this budget that they will see that will impact them? We talked about potentially trying to get two additional officers mm -hmm. on the force. What else comes out of this budget mm -hmm. that you think will be a positive for the city? Positive for the city? Well, I think you're seeing some road work going on. <laughs> and I talked in the state. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure at this moment that that's a positive for the city. <laughs> it's a positive. It's, it's, it's painful progress, but it's progress. <laughs> it's painful, I, yes. I drive it myself. I, I deal with it, too. I'm all over the city every day going to my different appointments and meetings and mm -hmm. uh, meeting with citizens. And so I, I'm in the exact same boat. Um, but it's, it's progress. It's a growing pain, but it's good pains to have. I know. It's hard to sugarcoat road <laughs> construction. I mean, uh, what you'll be seeing... Road construction is one thing. Yeah. There is almost not a corner that you hit in this city that is not from, from East Main right. going over to, to, toward Ohio. Mm -hmm. West side of the city, not so much, but right. it, it's, it's, it's rough over it's a lot. It's Up a lot and of down work. Chester Boulevard, and it's and it's your main arteries. Yeah. South A is now blocked up. Chester Boulevard, A Street. I mean, yeah. you've got a lot torn up. And I have to remind people sometimes that not ev just because a road is in Richmond doesn't mean it's within my jurisdiction. Some of these main roads <laughs> are part of NDOT's scheduling and NDOT's work, and we have right. a good partnership with NDOT. But they do that scheduling. They schedule that work. Uh, and so there's a, there's a delineation between the city roads and the, the NDOT roads and, and those projects that are going on. Uh, you will be seeing coming out of my office very soon, uh, quite possibly still this week, uh, a campaign called Paving the Way. And so as I've been aware of this and I've seen this and said, you know, it is a pain. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's a pain. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a growing pain. It's progress. I wish that as we've all been in this city for many years and said we could use some better roads, we could use some better uh, paving jobs, we could use some better infrastructure, I wish that we could all go to bed one night and the road fairy would come through town and sprinkle road fairy dust and we'd all wake up to beautiful new roads and infrastructures and better traffic intersections. It's just not going to happen like that. We have to go through this progress to get there. You know what it actually reminds me of? What? Have you ever remodeled your bathroom? Uh, you think it's a good idea parts of the house, until yes. you tear the bathroom apart. And then you think this project was supposed to take eight days. It's been three weeks. I still have no bathroom. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like that. But when it's done, you're happy that you went through it. You got it done. Uh, I think we're all going to be happier on the other side. I, I believe that. There is another side to this, right? Absolutely. There, oh. there, is, a, 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 there is another side where it's much better. Okay. Um, so, you know, we'll continue to work through this, but Paving the Way, yeah. uh, partnership with NDOT, and you'll, look up, you'll be able to search Paving the Way on Facebook and Twitter. And I've created a little cartoon mascot. Uh, his name is Rody the Road Cone. And so Rody will feed you traffic you updates. You have too much time on your hands. <laughs> I do not. Oh, I wish I did. <laughs> Truth is, my, you know, my background was in marketing and advertising. Right. And so in my moments of autonomy where I'm getting time to go out for a run, uh, or, I'm, or I'm doing something, you know, some simple work that I'm not having to put a lot of thought into for a little bit. My mind's kind of churning on, how do, I, how do I ease this a little bit? You know, it's a pain for all of us. Mm -hmm. And kind of filtering it through that marketing and advertising background and thinking, why don't we have sort of a one-stop social media shop where people can follow this, and why not turn it into a positive? So, yes, it's a pain, but we're literally paving the way to a better Richmond. We're paving the way to better shopping and better restaurants and, you know, uh, we're paving the way to a better city. So if you go follow that on Facebook and Twitter, then you'll be able to look at all those traffic updates and all those road closures and lane changes and all those things that 
you can get that ahead of time and say, oh, well, this Saturday they're they're closing that intersection to switch sides and the lanes switch, and right. you'll be able to follow that. And Rody the Road Cone, just a little cartoon mascot, softens it up a bit, uh, you know, brings a little humor to the to the chaos. <laughs> so uh, Rody the Road Cone, the mascot of paving the way. So you'll be seeing that very, very soon. We will be looking for that. And NDOT's excited about that as we've partnered together and I've spoken with Nathan Riggs. He says, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we try to post all that on Twitter, but it's hard to get people to follow NDOT. Nobody wants to follow traffic updates on Twitter. Right. So if we make it something a little softer, put a little cartoon character on it, and, and, and give it a softer image, paving the way to a better Richmond, a roadie, the road cone, it's more fun to follow a little cartoon road cone that'll tell you here's what's going on. You know, so We'll uh, like that on our Facebook page. Look for it on Twitter also. Uh, awesome. And we'll yeah, share that you. out there. Thank you. I appreciate that. And the more we share that, everybody's got the information. And so it softens it a little bit. Okay. Is it still a pain? Absolutely. All Absolutely. Right. And I saw that we've had, which um, this seems to be moving mm -hmm. toward demolition, Absolutely. is the old Reed building. Mm -hmm. um, on Chester Boulevard. That is, um, has gone through the process. Again, like the Blue Buffalo, there was some work between the city and the county. Things are moving mm -hmm. along, it seems. What now is the time frame that you can give for how things should happen if all things go well? Right. Uh, so do you want me to kind of walk us up to this point or just take it from this point on? Walk us up to this okay, point if you want there, to go back just a, to update some things. There's a lot of narrative There's a lot of work here. that there has gone is. into this. And I just can't speak enough to the tremendous partnership between myself, uh, the Richmond City team, City Council, County Council, County Commissioners. This has been a real coming together of elected officials that care very much about this community and, and that environmental hazard and safety hazard uh, that is on 27 that we all want to see gone. And so when you, when you think about that level of coming together and that level of partnership, uh, I, I'm just so thrilled with how we've all come together to do this. And it really is a true teamwork partnership. But this started quite a while back. You know, I put a, I put a real bullseye on this, oh my gosh, uh, pretty soon after coming into office. So it's, this has probably been about a year and a half of work to get to this point. Uh, even though I've only been in, you know, a year and what, 10 months now, this started pretty early on. Uh, so to kind of walk us through this narrative, when I first came into office, there had been a, the first thing you need in this process is a hazardous material survey. You got to survey the land and see what hazardous materials you're dealing with before you can start this whole conversation about who's going to remediate the hazardous materials so that we can then tear the building down, okay? So that had actually been done and it was, it was just uh, referred to as the Cardinal Report because of the company that it came from. When I came into office, there was a, a cardinal report that laid out the hazardous waste inside the building and the hazardous contamination through the asbestos and the, the lead and this and that. That report came with a shelf life and it had expired, so it was of no longer any use. So we knew that we had to back the truck up and go all the way to step one and go all the way back to that. Before we could even try to move down this road, we had to back up to that again. Uh, so the very first thing was talking to the company TRC, of which we are still working with, uh, and establishing a new hazardous material survey. That was my very first conversation with our county officials on how to partner together to move through this process. So I, I went to county council and said, would you partner with us and contribute $125,000 or up to half of the total cost Oh, I'm sorry, half or up to 125 to cover the cost of the hazardous material survey. Our best guess at that point was that was going to cost about $250,000. They agreed to that. And that was really the beginning of our partnership to move through this. Um, we then hired the company TRC and they spent several weeks. It was a very long process. We got regular updates from Brooks Bertle uh, during our common council meetings, which you can go back and watch those updates even if you'd like to uh, on WCTV online. Uh, Thank and you. you know, a little plug for the website, wctv.info, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so uh, he gave regular updates through that process. What that hazardous material survey generated was a, a document well over a thousand pages uh, that laid out building by building every bit of contamination all throughout the property uh, from asbestos to lead and so on and so forth. Uh, we are co-owners of with the county on that information. So we took the the digital copy and the paper copy over to the county. We share that information. Mm -hmm. From that very large document, 
we had several professionals look at it to give their very best estimate of what it was going to cost to remediate and demolish the building. Uh, so from that, then we determined the number, that which was going to be approximately $8.1 million. Okay. That was the best guess of several professionals that looked over that. Uh, we had started conversations with Indiana Finance Authority already. They, they, they were back in this process even before I came in as mayor about at least contributing to the remediation. They wanted to play a role in helping get this done. Uh, once we had the hazardous materials survey, uh, Indiana Finance Authority came to us and said, we may be able to loan you up to a million dollars interest free for the remediation phase of this. We thought that was a tremendous offer. Uh, but we wanted to continue through until we had everything completed and were ready to move to where we are now. Mm -hmm. During that process, they came back to the table and said, we might be able to offer you a loan for the entire amount, possibly, and, and interest free. They weren't sure if the entire amount was available mm -hmm. or if they could do it all interest free. That's a tremendous offer though. Uh, even as an if, it was a tremendous offer. So the uh, questions that I asked were, uh, would we be able to uh, switch securities midstream? We'll go to redevelopment and ask redevelopment to be the secured repayment source for this. Okay. Uh, but could we switch that midstream if we identify a separate repayment source? They gave us the assurity we could do that. Uh, can we seek out private partnership to buy down the principal of the loan and re-amortize that with no penalties and no, uh, no danger of changing interest rates if we have any or don't have any? We were assured that we could do that as well. Uh, so we had to take that to council as a resolution and get permission to apply for the entire amount uh, to see if what they would come back with. That's when we got the offer of two separate loans, uh, one bearing no interest, one bearing a 2% interest, both for the project as a whole, but sort of broken into two pieces. And so when you take those two, that non-interest bearing side and the interest bearing side, and you combine them, what you end up with is a, a full loan that averages out to just over 1% interest. Uh, okay. So once we had uh, approval from council to apply for that, we got the word back that that's where we were sitting. We had those two ordinances then before council. I then went to the county and asked that we continue our partnership and asked county council and commissioners to contribute $2 million to buy down the principal of that going back to that previous conversation I'd had with Indiana Finance Authority to buy down the principal and lessen the payments and lessen the burden. Uh, they had several discussions and came back with an offer of $1.42 million. Uh, and in any negotiation, that's what you have to expect. And so, again, I can't speak enough to how much I appreciate not only their partnership, but how swiftly they moved on this. Mm -hmm. We were on a pretty tight deadline to really get some answers together and get this done. Right. And they moved very quickly, which I highly appreciate. Uh, came to the table with that offer. Uh, there were some caveats involved. They put that uh, that application into uh, Wayne were County. Were you e expecting that? Were you expecting them to go, yeah, we'll give you $1.42 million, but we want you to do this, promise not to do this, yeah, that type I think, thing? Yeah, I think you have to. In any negotiation, you have to. You always have to know in any, go in any negotiation, you're coming to the table with your wish. Uh, you're rarely ever going to go to the table and say, this is what I want, and someone says, sure thing. Uh, you have to expect that someone's going to come back. They came back with a, a list of caveats. We negotiated within those. Uh, we struck one of those even. Uh, we modified some of the caveats that were in front of us. I wanted to make sure that I, you know, I can only guarantee that I'm here until December 31st, 2019 as mayor. I can't guarantee that I'm mayor January 1, 2020 because that exceeds my first term. Right. Uh, you know, even in running for re-election, I, I just can't guarantee that. So I don't want to tie a future mayor's hands into agreements that I made. So that was one of my pushbacks on the caveats is, I'm willing to agree to some of this, but if I am not mayor on January 1 of 2020, it, it must dissolve. And they agreed to that. Uh, we thought that was a fair agreement. So we set all that in place, created an interlocal agreement. Uh, the, that's when the attorneys come in and do all their work. Mm -hmm. uh, took that interlocal agreement back to council for their approval. And last Thursday is when we had our first pre-bid meeting. We were hoping, you know, if we get 10, 15 contractors on site uh, to bid on this, we'll, we'll probably see some good competition come out of this because right. they'll know they need to you know, outbid each other. Uh, what we saw was remarkable. We saw 67 individuals show up representing 46 companies from all over the country. We had companies from Chicago, New York, St. Louis. Uh, we had a company from Minneapolis. It was tremendous. 
and some some fairly large companies and it created a buzz in the room like oh my gosh this company's here they're a pretty big company and that's what helps us gain leverage in that bidding process so we had scheduled only one pre-bid meeting and, and let them know this has to happen on one day right it was so chaotic with that many people we ended up uh allowing a second day so october 10th will be a pre-bid meeting part two um the deadline and that is a complete walk through they understand what's in the bid process yes. plus they walk through the building yes absolutely yes um so october 26th will be the the uh, bid deadline and those bids will be open at our board of works meeting at 5 p.m on october 26th okay. uh, they'll then be taken under advisement they'll be scored based on uh, the bidder that can be the most responsive and responsible and we hope that through that process uh awarding will happen sometime I don't want to set a date, but early to mid-November. Okay. Uh, that's what we'll be looking for is to but award you all contract. still have deadlines that you're trying to hit to Absolutely. get loans closed and things. So, we need to. So you're looking for yes. that early November Because we are date. susceptible to an interest rate change based on moving into the fourth quarter, and we don't want to see that happen. Okay. We did put some pa a council. I shouldn't say we. Our, our council uh, had the foresight to put a little padding so we won't have to go back and rework the ordinances knowing that we could see movement in the interest rate. So. I think we have the legislative leeway. If we do see a slight uptick in the interest rate, we'll still have the padding there to move forward. The last thing that we wanted to do was have to back up, you know, at that late in the game. Right. So uh, hopefully we'll see awarding of that bid in early to mid-November. And if all continues on this trajectory, we have some historical components we have to go through as well. Um, we will see heavy machinery at the first of the year. And so what they will do once on site, we say January, February, before you see heavy machinery on site because Indiana winter. Weather. Yeah, it's just going to be weather permitting. If it's as mild as last year, yes. If Absolutely. We get if it's as mild as last year, we'll see them out there even earlier than that, but I don't want to make any of those promises. Um, one thing I've learned as mayor is I throw out soft, soft dates. <laughs> they become concrete very quickly. Um, so I'll say January, February for heavy machinery. Okay. Uh, what they have told us is they will uh, remediate and demolish in concurrent stages. So they'd remediate a portion of a building. Once that is remediated, they would begin demol uh, demolition of that portion and then begin remediating the next section and continue to move in that pattern. Uh, that pattern will take about 18 months to complete. Wow. And so we would be looking at July, maybe August of 2019 for complete demolition and clearing of the land. And so it's a, it's a, it's a lengthy process. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of the questions that I've kind of seen out there mm -hmm. that I think people would like you to yeah. respond to. Sure. There's been conversation as to whether portions, all or part of that building, can be buried on that site. Mm -hmm. Does it all have to be trucked away? Is any part of it going into our landfill? Mm -hmm. No, based very on what you know right very now. Very good questions, actually. So. Uh, there is still recyclable steel in the building, and we have a recycling credit built into, um, into the bid specs uh, so that we know we'll receive a recycling credit for that. Okay. Uh, based on the hazardous nature of the material once it's ground up, if we can get a really good, clean abatement process, some of it will be able to be buried on site uh, uh, if, in fact, we're able to abate it to that level through, through the abatement process. And, and I think we should be able to. Most of the signs say we should be able to clean up the contamination enough that a good portion of the building should be able to be ground up and buried on site. Uh, and that will help the overall cost of this project absolutely. if you're not trucking that away. Yes. And then the remaining will be trucked away. What will go into our landfill, uh, drywall, curtains, carpet, windows, there aren't many left in the building, but what are left? Um, I am not interested in dropping a hospital in our landfill. Our, hand, our landfill has a, a lifespan, mm -hmm. and then I want to shorten that lifespan by dropping an entire hospital in our landfill. So uh, we'll recycle what we can, uh, bury as much as can be buried, and then truck the rest away. It's better to pay for that trucking fee uh, than it is to shorten the lifespan of our landfill through that. So, But there are those uh, sort of um, circumstantial components, like I said, carpet, tile, drywall, things like that, that will go into our landfill. I know you've spoken to this, but just so that it is out there, mm -hmm. this building, this land, when it is being developed, will stay on the tax rolls, yes? Or go on the tax rolls, yes? So that's a good conversation. So that's one of the conversations that we've had within my office as we move through this. Right now, um, you have 
uh, a parcel of land uh, and because it has not gone through, it's not completed through the, the, the tax sale with the county, then it, it sort of sits in that uh, bureaucratic limbo. Uh, through this process, we would end up taking ownership of that entire parcel. Uh, and so uh, the goal will be to put a sort of a, a, a deed covenant, if you will, that would say that uh, whoever purchases this land, we intend for it to be on the tax roll. So that's how we will approach that moving into the future development. And you mentioned whoever purchases this land. Mm -hmm. We've seen numerous times parcels of land going out for a dollar, two dollars. Is there any thought process as to how much of this land can actually be sold so that some of that money could be used again to pay down the debt Absolutely. for taxpayers. There, there was some of that assessment work done uh, a few years back, uh, and there were some numbers put to that. I'm not going to repeat any of those numbers because I don't have those concrete in my hand, and that work's going to have to be redone anyway. Right. And again, I can throw those numbers out; they'll become very concrete very quickly, uh, and that's not going to that's not going to do any of us any good. But is the intention at this moment to use that land as incentive for a developer? No. Uh, I think at this point we fully intend to sell that land to put it towards our principles. That, that's been our goal from the start in this process. So, uh, but I think it's really important that we look at what we want to see on that site. What do we want to see developed there? Um, what will benefit our city there? What will help us? Um, so I think it's important to have those discussions as well. As a financial partner, how much is the county being brought into those discussions. I mean, is, is this a joint ownership now? It will not they've be. they put some money into this? No, it will not be. Uh, in the very early conversations, if you were following from the very early stages, what I had told the county uh, when we first established that partnership and all the way up to the $2 million ask, which that's a pretty long span of time, mm -hmm. I had continued to state uh, whatever the county contributes, we will track as a percentage of the total project upon sale of the land then the county would be refunded that amount. Um, in the negotiation process of the caveats, that was stricken from the language and is not any longer a part of the interlocal agreement. Um, we agreed at the table through that negotiation that uh, the county's contribution to this would be just that. It would be a contribution and then we would just use that money at that point to buy down the loans instead of reimbursing the county. Okay. So, you're watching In Focus on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. I probably should have told you that over 45 minutes ago. We've been at this for a little while. We're speaking with Mayor Dave Snow. Obviously, right now, the discussion has turned to um, the old Reed Hospital building. We had a chat question come in, so let's see what that is. Do you know if the bricks or concrete blocks can be recycled? Any interest of volunteer, um, any interest a volunteer crew for remediation? You know, I don't know about the bricks. The concrete, uh, again, there's a recycling credit already built in for the concrete part. The bricks okay. I can't speak to. And then entry, any interest in a volunteer crew for remediation, I don't think we could have a volunteer crew. It's a very dangerous site. It's a contaminated site. Uh, there I think is still asbestos that has to be removed from that absolutely. building, correct? Yeah, and, it's, and I can't stress enough how dangerous that site is. We had these... Uh, contractors from all over the country that went on site last week, several of them remarked, this is one of the worst and most dangerous buildings I've been in. Uh, and so that should really? just, yeah, it, it's very, very dangerous. And we continue to have trespassing issues, and I just can't say enough. Th this is not a place of exploration. Someone's going to get very, very seriously hurt or worse trying to explore that building. So um, I, I just can't say enough, stay out of that building. It's, it's a really dangerous place. And so I, get, I would have to immediately say that volunteers will not be an option um, in this process just because it's, just, it's too unsafe. Okay. You see the number on the screen, 973-8587. If you have a question for the mayor, we are taking your questions. I know I've kind of been hogging the conversation, <laughs> um, but that information is there. You can also send us a question via Twitter um, or via email, and the, the, that information is there, and we are under 45 minutes left in the show. Um, I've asked my questions on Reed. Is there anything else that you feel you need to put into this particular part of the conversation? Is there something else you think the citizens really need to know? Or have you seen things on social media? I know you don't have a ton of time that's been there, but you hear questions. Are there any questions you feel like you need to answer that you have been asked in this process publicly? I just think what's important is 
the way that that building is now, it's been such a detriment to everyone's morale. Mm -hmm. What they see is not only an eyesore, it's an environmental hazard, it's a safety hazard. Uh, it's, it's, it's frankly, it's disrespectful and disgraceful that so many people were born there, so many people lost their loved ones there, and that is what we see as what is left of that building um, that, that should have been respected more than that. And obviously it's never the intention to end up with it being in our hands for us to fix this, but it's where we are. Mm -hmm. And it, it's such an environmental and safety hazard, something has to be done, and so we're doing it. So it's gonna be difficult to transition out of seeing it as it is and start to vision for what, what can be there. And I hope people will email me, uh, send me letters and say, here's what I can start to see there and give us your input on that so that we kind of, as we talk about what can be there in the future, we're having some of that input from the community. So, you know, email me, call me, send me a letter. Uh, What's your email address? Email address, dsnow at richmondindiana.gov. Okay, we'll try to get that up on the screen later and make yeah. sure we try to, to sure. bring that in I if would we just, can. I would just love to hear those thoughts. Okay, I'm um, gonna go back to something that, that you brought up um, mm -hmm. again in your state of the city a while ago and mm -hmm. you, you talked about it in campaigning, you brought it back around, um, the conversation about the Human Rights Commission mm -hmm. or what that would be. At one point it was an idea of maybe not calling it that. Right. You brought it back up last January, mm -hmm. seemed like that name might stick. Mm -hmm. Where is that conversation and what do you see that commission group of people looking like and mm -hmm. when will the citizens begin to see some movement as far as legislation conversation with sure. the council on that? It is something I'm still very passionate about and we've made progress on that. So in looking back at the Human Rights Commission as it existed, it, it faced challenges. and. So before moving forward, it's been important to dive into some of those challenges, and they are intricate and they are time consuming to move through. Um, I will be honest in saying much more so than I anticipated. <laughs> so, but I've had a lot of conversations with former members. I've had a lot of meetings. I've done a lot of research. Uh, Earlham has done some research on this subject about the impact of the Human Rights Commission, and I still am interested in changing the name. Uh, okay. The reason that that sort of went into limbo for a moment is the legal department said you may have to keep that name. We have to make sure that it doesn't have to be called that to fit into the uh, budgetary requirements. Uh, okay. But my response to that is, I've said all along, I, I really don't believe that the city should be the sole funder of this. So if the city's not the sole funder, then does it have to fit within that box that says it has to be called a certain thing? And so legal's been continuing to work on that. Uh, so I still truly believe this needs to be a community partnership. And I, we still have some more work to do. Uh, I'm ambitious, so I'm always trying to do things right now. But it is more important to do them right than to do them fast. And we've got to make sure that we have a deep understanding of the challenges that were faced before so that we do not set something up that is deemed to fail in the future. We don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I, and I don't want to put the cart before the horse. I, I've said it before in the State of the City Address and even before that back in the campaign that uh, the ordinance itself has to come before the commission. And so I've, I've been putting things in place right now to still work on the ordinance side of it. Let's work on that first, and then let's put the community partnership piece in place uh, to bring that commission together so that it, it has a more community feel. But it, but it is a necessary function, I still believe that. Um, it's a contingent point. It's gonna be a point of heavy debate when it does come up, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a conversation that we need to have because there needs to be that function of advocacy, it has to exist. Uh, it sends a beacon that our city uh, is, is a place of tolerance. It's a welcoming place, and just now more than ever, it's something that we need to have. I, I will continue to be passionate about that, but I'm diligent about doing my homework, and so I'm still working through that, but you'll see the ordinance side of it first before you see the commission side of it later. Okay, um, one of the things you talked about, one of the things you've tried to champion is workforce development mm -hmm. in this community. Mm -hmm. um, when the Blue Buffalo announcement was made, you were very upfront about saying that there were some changes, some additional education, some additional certification Absolutely. that um, members in our community needed to have mm -hmm. so that more 
people who live in Richmond Wayne County were mm -hmm. eligible for those jobs. Mm -hmm. um, the governor has announced his next level uh, jobs yes. program. Mm -hmm. um, Ivy Tech has tried to do some ramping up. Where are you seeing that process now that if you drive out near it, Blue Buffalo continues to grow, develop, and mm -hmm. that continues to be an impressive an impressive building and it's not just manufacturing but that's a research and development facility that mm -hmm. is going to be there too yeah so how is that process going I think it's going very well I mean obviously the physical development of the site is coming along very well uh, you're seeing you know, we're going back to road closures again but the infrastructure upgrade right. around the site is beginning uh, and so and I attended the Blue Buffalo uh, meeting at Ivy Tech where they sort of began to introduce themselves to the community. Mm -hmm. And just what a tremendous group and what a tremendous company. We are just so fortunate. Uh, the more we get to know the team and the more we get to share in their vision, just the more excited we get that they're coming to Richmond and that this is happening. Uh, you spoke about, it's, it's what I was gonna talk about was the, uh, the next level program through Ivy Tech, tremendous. Uh, this is invaluable to this community to take advantage of these work skill certificate programs that skill you into the workforce and uh, manufacturing matters working through the skill up program uh, it's all that's what I said in that video that I created that you you referred uh, to is this is about connect the dots and the, the dots are all here you know the Excel Center Richmond Adult Education uh, our work one office uh, manufacturing matters Ivy Tech I mean these pieces are here and they have their hands out just trying to get anyone to take that hand for that hand up and say, you know, you got the, you got these certificate programs, you've got this training, it's all here, just take advantage of it. So what do you say to those people who say, there's still not enough manufacturing here? That there still needs to be more jobs brought in? Absolutely, I, I, I say there's, there's a lot of jobs here, there really are. I, co I completely understand that we always need to be looking on the horizon and planning for a diverse economic landscape of our future, but you've also got to take stock of what's here now and do your best to take advantage of it and uh, bridge that gap. If you don't have the skill set to skill up in, the, in today's workforce, because today's workforce is very different than your grandfather or your father's workforce. Uh, you know, I try to play my role in this and do work short Wednesdays. Uh, we haven't had Are you one. still doing those? I, I haven't done one in a little while because we've been so busy with Reed and the budget, uh, but, uh, or with the old hospital and the budget, but uh, I have done those. The last one that I did was Paragon Caskets. Uh, and when you go out to the new shop floors of today, mm -hmm. it is just so different. I mean, you, you have uh, guys working on what looks from a distance to be just a, a good old fashioned machine press. And then you get up close and there's a touch screen computer pad, you know, with things that have to be put into this machine. It's just very different than it used to be. And so you have to go through these skill up and these technical, cer technical certificate programs to earn these positions on the line. It's just, it's essential. And so uh, I just can't stress enough how important it is to navigate through the resources that are available in this community. Many of them provide transportation, they provide childcare. Uh, the NatCo Empowerment Community Center provides resume writing, mock job interviews. They have the career closet. So if you say, I don't have the clothes for the job interview, NatCo Empowerment Community Center will say, here's, here's the outfit. Let's help you write a resume. We'll take you through a mock interview. We'll connect you with Manufacturing Matters, Ivy Tech. I mean, it's all here. It would be such a different conversation if we said, how do we get these resources into our community? Mm -hmm. But that's not where we are. We're light years ahead of that and light years ahead of many other communities that don't have it. It's here. Uh, so you just have to navigate through those resources and you can go to my Facebook page and watch that video where you get a face-to-face -face introduction with all the people in those organizations and their phone numbers and their email addresses so you can call and make that appointment and say, I'm, I'm ready to skill up and skill into the workforce because uh, those jobs are there and more are coming. Uh, so when people say we need to add more jobs, Blue Buffalo is bringing a lot that aren't even here yet. And you still have time, but like I said in the video, no time to waste. Uh, and who's your opportunity? What a great website where employers are going to showcase what they have mm -hmm. and post jobs. You can post your resume and, and work to connect with a, with a, with a career uh, in this area. So who's your opportunity com Can't stress that one enough either. So and that one is a cross county uh, agreement also. So it's not just yeah, sometimes you, you might want to live in Wayne County, but your job may right. be 
in Randolph County. Yeah, you can do comment. that on the website. You can search and say, I, I don't mind searching for jobs in Wayne Randolph and Jay County, or I, I only want to be in Wayne County. And you can narrow that search how you want. Mm -hmm. um, and I invested in that website because I saw the importance that it held in the field of workforce development. I mean, it's a powerful hub for internships, careers, and not just on the employee side, uh, but the employer side, being able to create a video to say, we are a company ABC, this is who we are, this is what we do, this is why we want a better workforce, this is who we're looking for, uh, so you can connect with that. Man, it's a powerful hub. So again, utilize these resources. If you're unemployed or feeling underemployed, don't feel like you're stuck. Uh, use those resources that are there and navigate into successful employment. It's, it's here for you. It really is. What are we missing in your eye, in your estimation in this community in order to bring in, because we do, if you look around, there are some jobs in this area. Mm -hmm. People are trying to decide where to live. Mm -hmm. As mayor, you kind of look at that big picture and, and you spoke at the opening of the Quality of Place conference mm -hmm. that was held here. Mm -hmm. One or two things real quickly that, that you think this area needs, Richmond in particular, since you're mm -hmm. mayor of Richmond, needs to do to help attract people to move into this sure. area because that obviously will also help our base overall, having more people come, live, build homes, whatever. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, you know, one, you, you said homes and housing is one of those. Uh, Jeff Plaster on our county council is working on that housing study right now that he is doing through the uh, Eastern Indiana Regional Partnership and so he can give a much more in-depth report on that I think in the near future because I think that's about to be completed. But right. uh, we do have a shortage in some of our housing areas and uh, the young professionals that would prefer to live in a nicer apartment, we have a shortage there. So we have to fix some of the housing issues. Uh, we have to make more housing available and apartments available in our downtown in the center of our city because they, they want to be downtown. Uh, I'm working on some of those quality of life amenities because when you're looking at these young professionals in today's economy that some of them have the ability to take their career with them. Uh, it's, it's in their computer and they can say, uh, I've got my career, it's established, now I'll plant my feet where I want. And what they're looking for is a city that provides a beautiful downtown infrastructure with green space, which is exactly why we put Elstro Plaza right where it is. Uh, it goes miles in that quality of life department that the young professionals are looking for. You're going to see dedicated bicycle and pedestrian paths coming into downtown very soon. That adds another major element to making downtown walkable and bikeable. Because uh, these are the things that they say, this is what I want out of the city uh, where I choose to live. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to be able to be downtown. I want to be able to shop at the locally owned stores ride my bicycle around and, and save on gas. And so we have to have some of those amenities, but we have to have the housing available, uh, and we have to have a digital infrastructure that will allow for that as well. And so there's a lot of discussion about the digital infrastructure and what that looks like to accommodate some of these higher level tech jobs uh, that are out there and some of these companies that need a pretty robust digital infrastructure to operate. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we've been looking at that as well. So these are the things that are on like, the horizon. You know, the, the right now issue, falls right back on the resources we were just talking about. But when you get out to the horizon, the, the 10 years from now and beyond, the digital infrastructure and having the, the walkability, the bikeability, you know, these are the things that are going to be important for the young people that are searching for a place to live and take their careers with them. Because we're only going to see more of that, not less. We're going to see more and more and more young people coming out of high school and college that, well, here's my career. I carry it with me in my side bag. Now where do I want to live? And, we, and then we got to capture them talked about earlier your hiring of Brian Irvin as mm -hmm. the um, new head of the the sanitary district mm -hmm. you brought in a number of people there have been a number of changes as as there are in any administration talk a little bit about some of the people that you brought in during this last year Jack Cruz I know one is that has stepped in mm -hmm. um, obviously want to mention a couple of the positives give me one or two do-overs if, if we had it to do all over again a do-over yeah if, okay. if you a had it to do all tough. over again we, we botched that one. We didn't roll that one out well. We didn't. <laughs> That's interesting. I didn't think of it in terms of a do-over. Um, what would we do over if we had it to do over again? Um, that's hard to, on the spot like that. I'm thinking here. Okay. Um, if we had to do it over, what would we do over again? Um, 
That's a really. Can I be thinking about it while we you go to the next question? You can be thinking about it. Okay. So, tell me about a couple of the new members of your of your crew and what they bring. Um, a, a couple of them are actually on the Cuffs program. Uh -huh. Jack Cruz being one who mm -hmm. has come home, who is who stepped into right. infrastructure and development when Beth Fields stepped into being the the city controller. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, a new HR director within the last year. Mm -hmm. Imani Murphy. Um, tell me a, a little bit about those folks, how they're progressing with their jobs, uh, and the, what changes they you think they're going to be able to bring absolutely. to the city. Yeah, you know, Beth's move into the controller position uh, really stemmed out of uh, working closely with Beth and seeing her ability to vision for what can be. And really starting to say, you know, here's where we need to invest a vision for the future of where we can be and where we can go. And when I started to see that come together, and then she helped with last year's budget process because mm -hmm. she had that strength. And then sitting at the table and helping with the budget process and really uh, coming in and saying, well, wait, before we make that decision, let's think about two, three years from now, what could be here if we move this? And that really showed the strength of, of a true city controller. Um, and so that's when I said, I really think you need to be in, in this chair instead of that chair. And so the decision was made to move her. It was a tough decision to make, mm -hmm. uh, but the controller needs to really be that other key visionary piece uh, to help us be moving in the right direction financially. Uh, we were very fortunate after that move to find Emily Palmer to fill the deputy controller position. She's a tremendous supporter in the finance office. Um, Imani has stepped into the HR department mm -hmm. and has just done a tremendous job. I get so many positive comments about Imani's leadership in that department. She has a, a, a deep understanding of human resources nice. uh, and she's been doing a really, really good job in there. Uh, we have Jack Cruz up in IND. Jack's been doing a great job. He is our chief negotiator in our union process right now. Mm -hmm. And so I stay in close communication with Jack. And so now we have Brian Irvin in the sanitation department. And so, I, you know, I would say it's hard to call any, it's hard to look back and call for do-overs uh, because I feel like where we are now, we're, we're headed in the right direction. And so you think even the mistakes we made were teachable moments. If we went back and said, well, I wish we hadn't made that mistake, well, then we might not have learned in that teachable moment. So do-overs are hard. But do we have weaknesses? Absolutely. I mean, I think one of the weaknesses of having a team this fresh is we don't carry with us that institutional knowledge. I don't have uh, a lot of department heads around me that are 10 years into this. Uh, so it's a new and fresh team. Uh, and so that can bring some issues with it. Uh, and so we have to consult with legal a lot. And, e and even AJ Sickman, our city attorney, mm -hmm. uh, has not been on board very long. And so there are challenges when you have a newer, fresher team. The major upside to that is we have a very driven, very passionate team. I am so regularly impressed when I call the department head meetings together. We have department head meetings uh, on every day of a council meeting. And we come together and all sit at a table and talk about all the issues that are going on in every department, uh, what we're doing to improve those issues, and trying to communicate with each other and work as a web of resources amongst each other. And I, I am just regularly humbled. And, and I, I'll be honest, I just feel outclassed. I mean, I sit at this table with these tremendous leaders, hearing them lead their departments and how they're doing it. And I'm impressed and humbled. And I think, my gosh, I'm so lucky to be a part of this team. So they're, they're really a great team. Uh, and so we face our challenges. But I think, you know, communication is communication's one of those weird things that always has one foot in a weakness and one foot in a strength. Would I say that my team is weak at communication? No. But would I say that we're always pushing to be better and so always doing that SWOT analysis to identify our own weaknesses? Absolutely. And do we find weaknesses? Yes. But we're always striving to cover those and bridge those and move them forward and be better. And so uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really super passionate team. I, that's one of the things I say the most when I go out and talk to the community mm -hmm. is I say, I can, I can just tell you with great confidence that your Richmond City team is working hard for you every day. I can't tell you the number of times that I'll walk out of my office and more than one of our department heads is still in their office and I leave late, you know, and, I, and I'll go in their office and go, you know, it's almost 9 p.m. It's time to get out of here. You know, come on, you got it. You got a life. You got to go home and they go, just a little more. I got a little more to do and I'll be out of here. I mean, but the, the, the work ethic and the strengths, I mean, it's, it's really impressive to see it in action. Nice. Yeah. I've heard you say on a couple of different occasions, um, various places, Richmond is on the verge of its next great renaissance. Absolutely. I believe that. 
what do you mean by that? What is it yeah. that you see? What do you think that is in place? And where do you think this sure. is going? Yeah, let me unpack that a little bit. Because I, I, I guess when I say it, I rarely ever unpack it. I just say it. You no, know? And, and, I've and I've just heard you say yeah. that on a couple and of And I do. Occasions. I say it a lot. I do. And what I mean by that is I, I, I you know, for so many years, not even just, I, I'm not even going to box this into the campaign or to my being mayor. Mm -hmm. My life here, um, more so in the campaign and more so as mayor, I'm bombarded with these old pictures of Richmond. This is what Richmond was. Look at how busy downtown was. Look at all the cars. Look at the trolleys. Remember, there were trolleys and look at this and look at that. Uh, and there's this mindset that what Richmond used to be is so much better than what Richmond is or what Richmond can be. And I hate that mindset. I'll be honest, I hate it. I'm a very firm believer that age isn't a number. Uh, you get old, or I would say age is, age is a number. <laughs> Getting old isn't a number. It's not associated with an age. Uh, getting old is when your past is just so much better than your future. You know, when you sit on your, your back porch one day and you say, well, my best days are behind me. Nothing more exciting in front of me. Nothing more I'm going to learn. No more challenges. No more mountains to climb. You've officially decided to get old at that moment. And people apply that filter to Richmond. Uh, wasn't our past the best? Wasn't our past <laughs> just the best? What about our future? Well, I don't know about our future, but our past was great. <laughs> and I, I don't like that. I really, truly believe when I look around right now and I feel the, the energy I feel the vibe that's going on, and I see the movement. I see Elstro Plaza, and I see this growing farmer's market, and I see people downtown. I see the Meltdown Ice Festival. I see progress all around our city. Uh, look at, uh, when, when, I was a, when I was a kid, the local businesses were all family businesses, most of them. Uh, you, you did your grocery shopping at Cox's and Berman's uh, was a drugstore, and Nolan's, they were all family names. And we're fortunate to have kept some of those. We still have Phillips Drugs, which we're lucky to still have. Um, but in my lifetime, I've seen that dwindle. And I've seen Big Box America start to take over. Mm -hmm. But just in the last very few years, uh, we've seen some growth. We see Roscoe's now has a second location. Right. And we see Radford's now has a second location. And as people say, well, what about Richmond's economy? Where are we going? We are seeing the rebirth of family-owned businesses growing in our city. And that, that is the verge of the next great renaissance of Richmond. So you think that our past was the best it could ever be. It's not true. We are on a trajectory to still be the best we could ever be. Uh, and I truly believe that. Not a lot of cities are doing what we're doing. We have a beautiful downtown. Uh, we have family-owned businesses that are growing. So I'm on my parents even now, and I say, when you go do your grocery shopping, you go to Radford's first. Get the things you can from Radford's, then go to Big Box America and get the rest. Shop local. Support these family-owned businesses. Um, we're growing in the right direction. So that's what I mean when I say we're on the verge of our next great renaissance. Look at our, look at our depot that's reopened. The EDC is in there. Right. Uh, so when we were standing up in that new open area in Better Homes and Gardens that they want the community to begin to use, you look out the windows, and now you get a much stronger view of that overpass there. And it needs painted. The concrete's a little, looking a little bad. Mm -hmm. And I was standing there talking to Valerie Schaefer and some other people and said, well, we need to get to work on that. And it's that rising tide raises all ships mentality. Well, let's talk to NDOT and see if we can get some new concrete on that, get some paint on that. Let's make it look better. Would we have taken notice of that if we weren't in a building that's been rejuvenated and now we're on the upper floor looking out the window? And it's this cascade effect that brings about the Renaissance and brings about Richmond's you know, next big time, the next big chapter. So I, I really feel like that's where we are. That's why I just, I get, I get so upset when people talk about the, the bad things and want to make it, want to paint this picture that Richmond's just this terrible city. Uh, it's a beautiful, amazing, wonderful place to live. And getting to be mayor of your hometown, is one of the greatest things that can ever happen in your life. So I'm privileged to be in this seat. I'll keep pushing it forward for everybody. Okay. We have another chat question. We're down to our last 10 minutes this or less. This goes so fast when we do this. We do 90 minutes wow. and we go, wow, there it goes. So amazing. we've got one more chat question. Right. I want to get this in before we start to break this out. So a question is, 
Which is one of the things you'd like to see happen before your team, uh, your, before your term as mayor is up? What is one of the things that you'd like to see happen before oh, your term man, as mayor is up? Oh, man, there's a lot of things. Everybody's actually. trying to um, <laughs> get you to think about some things. So that, that's a good thing. People are trying to envision some of what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that is a good thing. You know, I saw on Twitter, I go, I was just on Twitter. I wasn't tagging this or anything. I was just kind of scrolling through to see what people some thought. You have thought. too much time in your hands. I know. I got nothing but free time. <laughs> I, was, I was also juggling while I was reading Twitter. I thought, what am I going to do with my day? Uh, so I just, I kind of try to check sometimes. And somebody posted on Twitter just randomly, um, Richmond has felt more alive in the last month than it has in a long time. I love it. And I thought, oh, my gosh, how do I get this person on my team? Like, they're getting it. They're feeling it. And I appreciate that this, this person here is feeling it, too, and looking ahead. <sighs> That's hard to narrow down to one thing. You know, there are administrative things I would like to see done. Um, there are structural things within the structure of the city government that I would like to see done to make us even more efficient. Um, there are quality of life elements that I want to see done. So, um, you know, we talked earlier about the Human Rights Commission. That's something important to me. Uh, I want to see um, it's really it's really, really important to me before I go that um, I'm leaving uh, a really solid foundation for the next mayor and a playbook, if you will. Uh, too many mayors walk in the office and they don't have sort of a playbook. You kind of got to get the lay of the land and start going. Mm -hmm. um, no matter how I leave the office, I run for re-election and I'm beaten. Somebody takes the office from me. It's very important even then to welcome that new mayor into the office. It's who the people have chosen. And to say, here's all the projects we're doing. Here's every bit of advice I can give you to make you the best mayor you can be. Um, it's difficult to, uh, you got a lot of work to do as mayor, but you have a short amount of time to do it. Uh, you're given a four-year term, guaranteed. You're not guaranteed anything beyond that. Mm -hmm. And, and you, can't over, you can't outstay your welcome. You, you can't say, well, I'm going to be mayor for five terms. It's too much. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> Um, so when you think about, think about your personal career, whether you're, a, whether you're a, a nurse, a school teacher in banking, and how long you've been in that career. A lot of people will say, oh, I've been a teacher for 20, 23 years. Uh, most likely, the most you're going to be mayor is four or eight years. Um, that's a short amount of time to get a lot done. Think if, you were, if you're a school teacher and you've been a school teacher for 20 years, and I said, what if I would have only given you eight or four? It's a very different career. So you have to always know your time is very limited, and I'm not here to make a career of this. I'm here to get in, work really hard, make the most positive impact I can, and turn this over to another quality leader down the road. And so to finish up that question, um, downtown, it's very important to me to uh, establish this loop project that I've talked about for so long with our bicycle and our pedestrian paths connecting downtown mm -hmm. to the depot district, putting up those historical markers and wayfinding and making downtown a very, very special place in Richmond and linking that to the future of that city festival uh, that you, when I grew up, we had the Rose Festival Correct. and it meant a lot. And a lot of people say, Mayor, please bring back the Rose Festival. Well, we're not the city of roses anymore. And we don't seem to be doing a great job collectively of deciding what we are. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not the city of roses. What are we? Uh, and I think the Star Jeanette Foundation has done a good job of promoting the cradle of recorded jazz. So maybe we can expand on that. I'm doing a lot of work on that right now, determining that narrative of who we are, empowering the downtown, making it even more beautiful, and then launching into that new festival and, and that new way to celebrate Richmond every year is really important to me. So. That's a multi-layered question, but I appreciate it. I really thank you for that question. It's a great one. Okay. I appreciate you taking the time to no, thank come you. and hang thank out you. and talk and answer um, some questions from me as well as from the citizens. Um, are you doing a State of the City next year? Is that an annual speech for you? Absolutely, or I will gathering? be. Is yes. it? Are you? Uh -huh. Okay. And uh, I, I put it on my calendar that once we're finished with this budget process to start working on it. So I'll begin working on that as soon as we're finished with the budget process. But this is uh, the budget process uh, along with the former hospital work has mm -hmm. just been um, it's been a lot of work, but it's been a tremendous process. I mean, I, you know, it's very rewarding. Uh, you go through a lot of work, you sweat through it. It's a lot of late nights, but mm -hmm. when you see the fruits of your labor on the back end, it, it, it feels really, really good. So when we see that heavy machinery on site starting to take that hospital down, 
there will be no replacing that feeling of elation uh, that we'll feel at that point. That'll be great. Looking forward to it. Thank you so much, appreciate Eric. Really time. appreciate you having me. You won't mind me taking the last couple of minutes and not running all. off some not-for-profit uh, information for the community. I know you do this as part of your uh, conversation um, at city council meetings. I always do. Communications from the mayor. With yes. Updates of go what's going on. So here's some of what you can enjoy in and around um, the city over the next little bit. Mom and Me is taking place at... Um, the Wayne, it's Mom and Me Mondays, Father and Family Fridays, taking place Wayne County Historical Museum. It started, it runs through November 20th. Bring your preschoolers, complete their 20 adventure trunks, receive a free coupon. Um, that's a great place to go if you have not spent time at the um, Wayne County Historical Museum. Check that out. City Life, something I know that is very near and dear to you, very is coming up. Arts Life. in the Glen, October 7th, 5 to 9. Um, that has really grown into a very nice, very nice festival. I I can't even tell you how humbling it is to see two events that I created, City Fit and City Life, turn into what they are today. Uh, it's, it's very humbling. I just can't thank all the group, the, the people that now um, take care of those events. I just can't thank them enough for what they do. Nice. Live music, pond fire, hands-on activities, characters, live art, a lot of organizations involved in that, even the Indiana Arts Commission providing some grant money. It is free to go and enjoy. There will be some food available for sale. We talked about manufacturing. Primex Plastics invites the public to enjoy Manufacturing Day, facilities, tours, on-site interviews, popcorn, ice cream, bounce houses. That's this Saturday from 2 until 4 o'clock. Mentioned the Wayne County Historical Museum. Museum. They do Halloween like almost nobody else around here does. Tales from the Departed takes place this Saturday, October 7th, 10 to 4 at Earlham Cemetery. Characters um, dressed in costume of the times portray important people from Richmond's past and share their history. Check that out, Tales from the Departed. Richmond um, Civic Theater presenting Holes. For box office information, give them a call, 962 one eight one six or visit their website to go rct.org tickets are on sale now uh, holes taking place this weekend the seventh and eighth also this weekend there's nothing to do around here. I know, I the know, right? The 34th annual 4th Street Fair is going to be taking place. I lived on 4th Street for probably almost 28 years. I'm not there now, but it is still a great festival. Two days, go, enjoy. Lots of food, music, crafts from 10 until 5, both the 7th and the 8th. If you need more information about it, there's a number there on the screen, 962-1010. Bravo is going on. Voting for that goes until October 21st voting actually voting ends on October 16th so go to readbravo.org and vote for your favorite there's always some very creative things there Salvation Army is taking applications for their Christmas assistance program for Wayne County residents that's taking place October 9th through the 13th, um, 10 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. Call the Salvation Army, 966-7791 for more information. Want to remind you that once again that next week we will be talking with Elijah Welsh. If you have questions for Elijah about the Richmond Sanitary District, their rate structure, why they're doing what they're doing, send those questions to WCTV at IUE.edu before noon on Wednesday. We'll take the following week off and then on the 26th we'll be back for 90 minutes it's talking about the opioid problem here in the area. Send your questions for um, our guests to WCTV at IUE.edu. We'd like to get those questions in ahead of time. Again, questions for Elijah, WCTV at IUE.edu. That show will be on next week at 6 p.m. Thank you very much for watching this edition of In Focus. Good night.
Hi, I'm Aaron Stevens, host of the CUFS program, WGTV Channel 11. Join us on Wednesday at 6 o'clock with our guests, Mr. Jack Cruz and Ms. Beverly Budd of the city of Richmond. And I think that you will enjoy the show. People of that community, people of that neighborhood can walk up and talk to him if he, you know, decides that he doesn't want to. Again, that's the CUFS program, WGTV Channel 11. Whitewater Government Television, Channel 11.